Thanks for joining me today. I appreciate you stopping in to learn more about uh, how service stations were domesticated uh, in the early 20th century. And I got interested in this topic in part uh, by research that I was doing for a museum uh, up in Cleveland that was thinking about putting on a service station uh, exhibit. And in the course of doing that research, I found a lot of articles in trade journals that were directed at service station owners and how they could make their gas stations or what were known as service stations at the time uh, more friendly toward women uh, and their automobiles. And so from that work, I became uh, interested in pursuing that line of how you move from uh, service stations that are, you know, predominantly about providing gasoline to making them kind of warm and cozy, if you will, for women consumers. And you might wonder, you know, what was the point of doing that? Well, the point of doing that was there were actually a significant number of women who were driving cars in the 1920s. And as you can see, by 1928, there are over a million cars registered to women uh, in the United States. And I like this image in particular because this is a, a woman who is clearly um, doing more than just driving, but actually servicing her own automobile. And so catering to a large number of women uh, consumers of gas and oil is something that service stations certainly would be interested in. Now, women had been driving cars from the very beginning. And what we see are a significant number of women who are you know, testing their own uh, abilities from the very uh, inception of the car. Um, you know, cars become uh, important around the 1890s and uh, by the turn of the 20th century, there are a significant number of women who are owning and driving. And in particular, what you see are women who are participating on a number of different levels. And so in the course of World War I, some of them are serving as ambulance drivers, uh, you know, doing that kind of dual function of nursing and ambulance driver. Um, and back here, when the war is over, one of the things that you see happening are women who are pairing up and buddying up and going on uh, road trips, as we would refer to them in this century. Uh, it was not uncommon. Uh, and one of the things that you see also happening is not just the gas and oil industry catering to women drivers, but the clothing industry as well as a sidebar. Uh, and so you see these two women who are very fashionably turned out here sitting on the bumper of their car uh, in our driving clothes. And so driving clothes were uh, part of women's attire when they went out driving in their automobiles, those laced up boots and great hats and uh, really you know, kind of sophisticated wear. So these long distance trips became common and one of the more popular um, books of the 1920s uh, about women in automobiling is this one, uh, Westford Hobo's Winifred Hawkridge Dixon. And it, it recounts the trip that she and several of her friends took uh, across the country in their car. And one of the things to keep in mind is that getting in a car and driving across the country, male or female, in the early 20th century was a chore. Uh, a lot of these automobiles were open or they had just very kind of basic tops and you don't get the great roll up windows, there's not heaters in them, there's no air conditioning. They're very rudimentary, um, you know, suspension is not great, the roads are terrible, uh, you know, a lot of them are just rutted out wagon trails. But the other thing to keep in mind is that if you take a road trip in this time period, you're not coming across gas stations, you're not coming across service stations. Uh, as we do today, you get on the freeway and you, you can bet on a gas station every you know, 10, 20 miles. Women who get behind the wheel and take long distance trips in this time period are really having to know more about their car and being able to keep it on the road. So uh, Dixon in her book talks about what it takes to actually um, maintain a car uh, while you're on the road, when you don't have a service station to pull into, you don't have the AAA man to come out and help you. And so they talk about, you know, trying to get sand out of the engine and having to, you know, fiddle with the carburetor and deal with all of the, the gasoline and oil issues that come about, flat tires, et cetera, et cetera. 
And so motoring, as it was often referred to in this time period, was something that really required skill. Uh, and women were not shy to taking on this task. Now, there are, as you might imagine, people who are concerned about women and driving cars. And these are kind of cultural stereotypes of you know, women handling big machines and, you know, are they going to be able to, you know, do what's necessary to get the car from point A to point B. And, you know, there are some concerns and again, things to keep in mind. Um, these cars at this time period at the turn of the 20th century, they don't have power steering. And so you had to muscle a car a little bit to, you know, get the wheel turn. Uh, they're stick shift as this woman here is demonstrating in her ad early on their crank start. So it takes a bit of muscle to, you know, get the car cranked around. And it, there's a danger, man or woman, in cranking a car. You get reports of, you know, the crank kind of, you know, coming back and hitting we, men and women in the arm, breaking hands, breaking their arms, etc. cetera. Uh, and so for people who live in Southwest Ohio who are interested in this history, they'll be familiar with the name Kettering um, and, Kettering is the guy who invents the electric starter and putting an electric starter in an automobile then makes it possible for uh, more people, men and women, to drive cars because they're easier to drive, as you can see in this Chevy advertisement from the early 20s. You know, easy to start, that's that electric start. Easy to steer, still no power steering, but you know, they're, they're making modifications, uh, light pedal action, easy uh, shift gears. And so this is an ad that is obviously catering to the woman driver and saying, you know, yeah, women can drive these cars. And they're demonstrating it every day uh, throughout the early 20th century. However, there are other concerns about cars and women and again, cultural stereotypes. And I would imagine that there's actually more concern about what men are doing in the back seats with women perhaps than what women are necessarily being subjected to in the back seat of the car. But these are concerns A, that are real, but are also played up by some car manufacturers, including Oldsmobile. Um, and so what I want to show you now is uh, about a six minute really extended advertisement for Oldsmobile, where they're, you know, kind of talking about or speaking to the concerns about men and women in cars and the private spaces that these provide and what possibly could happen in the back seat of a car. So let's take a look. Come away with me to see In my merry old Oldsmobile You can go as far as you like with me In my merry Oh, that's... 
as you like with me in my great big automobile. Oh, my operation. Go away, you big baboon. Or I'll knock you for a roll of loops and make it soon. You're the type that should be taken out drowned. You give me an Oldsmobile outside. Many people thought the automobile would never replace the horse, but it certainly took the place of the parlor sofa on a Sunday afternoon. Those old cars looked funny, but they struggled along in spite of the horse laughs. Let's all sing about the old olds that's still rolling right along. Now follow the ball. Young Johnny Steele has an Oldsmobile. He loves a dear little girl. She is the queen of his gas machine. She has his heart in a world. Now when they go for a spin, you know, she tries to learn the art. So he lets her steer while he gets her ear And whispers soft and low Come away with me, Lucille In my merry Oldsmobile Down the road a light will fly Automobubbling exists in that cartoon, that extended advertisement. Um, and there is some sense of that, that, you know, this is a, a cartoon from the 1920s. And uh, again, others might be familiar with the tune, My Merry Old Mobile, it was a popular tune. Um, but even within the lyrics, you know, you can go as far as you like with me in My Merry Old Mobile is, uh, 
suggestive. But really what happens is that women are finding, of course, the automobile uh, a place of freedom. I mean, maybe that's sexual freedom or it's geographical freedom or it's cultural freedom, whatever the case may be. Uh, and being able to use the car to motor where they want, when they want, that sense of independence to go as far uh, again as they like, uh, whether again, it's geographically uh, spelled out or in other terms, women are not just buying cars and driving cars, they're becoming important consumers of everything that's related to cars. And this is oil and gas as well. And so you see women becoming part of the important component that service station and oil companies have to speak to. This isn't a an image from Philip 66, as some probably recognize. And you know, you might be surprised that it took a little while for gas companies to realize that, you know, women were consumers of gas and oil products as well. And by the 1920s, what they're finding is that women are comprising a third of those who are you know, buying gas, consuming gas, and again, related products. And so you see companies like Philips 66 who come out not with just gas and oil products um, advertised in a way that speaks to women, Texaco pictured here, but they'll actually create additional products. Uh, so Philips 66 in particular um, created a uh, window cleaner. Uh, so this is window cleaner that's intended for the windshield of your car. But the assumption, of course, again, is that for a woman, this would be useful in cleaning her windows at home. And in other ways, service station owners and or gas stations, as they will become known as, um, both at the corporate level by companies like Texaco and Philips, Gulf um, and Shell, they're going to respond by addressing service station design and products and presentation at that corporate level. But you'll also see some independent small guys um, catering to women as consumers of gas and oil products as a way to capture that important component of the market. And so if you're wondering, this is, you know, early 20th century service station, gas station, really. And it's often referred to as a gas depot. And so if you wanted to fill your car uh, in the turn of the 20th century, this is actually the more sophisticated method. Initially, if you needed gasoline, you bought it uh, in either small bottles at the grocery store or the corner shop, uh, or if you had a bicycle guy who was dabbling in cars, well, you might be able to get gasoline in a bottle or in a can, as you can see in this image, that way. Um, and eventually, uh, gas and oil companies like Penn Oil, which is the pump pictured here, develop the gasoline pump as a way to extract oil from an underground tank, or uh, in this case, a tank that sits uh, on the top of that concrete block there. But, you know, this is, cannot be described as attractive in any way. It's, you know, it's a mud pit. This is you know, a small shack where uh, the attendant would have, you know, taken money and exchanged money. But there are no pleasantries, no niceties. And what happens is that as more and more women take to the road and are driving, gas and oil companies realize that if they're going to attract that 33% of the market, they're going to have to improve conditions. And let's face it, there are men too who are not interested in you know, this kind of very rudimentary, basic kind of fueling post as a way to um, fuel their cars. And so gas station design or service station design uh, begins to evolve. And it evolves in relationship to being able to put um, service stations or gas pumps within suburban neighborhoods. So how do you design a gas station that's going to fit in a suburban neighborhood? Well, you make it look like a house. Uh, and again, this is a Phillips 66 uh, station that's pictured here. And so one of the initial designs that becomes very popular for gas stations uh, is referred to as the English cottage style. And as you can see, this is 
you know, very reflective of, you know, kind of traditional countryside English cottage. Um, and while this is a Phillips 66 uh, that's pictured here, among the first companies to go this route was the Pure Oil Company. Uh, and you can see this is just kind of a classic English cottage style that is reminiscent of a house. And if you start picking apart the details, you see, you know, the, the flower boxes under the window and the, the front window that's kind of uh, bayed out there a little bit. Well, that's reflective of what you would find in a typical home. But as you can see here, they're using it for um, you know, displaying you know, oil cans and uh, belts and brake pads and things of that nature. So they're taking these kind of homey characteristics and they're uh, adapting it to sell more gas and oil products, but it's an attractive style that will um, bring women in because it's very homey. A couple of fake, you know, um, chimneys there. You've got the trellis on the one side, uh, you know, waiting for a vine to come up, little opening gates in the front. It's very attractive design. And indeed, it's something that's going to fit well in a suburban neighborhood. And it gives you the sense that when you pull up to the pumps, you're not pulling up to the pump just to get gas, that you're actually you know, participating in the neighborhood process, that this is something that the attendant would come out, you would know him, he would know you, you would exchange pleasantries. One of the directives that um, gas and oil companies are coming out with to, again, cater more to women are to do things like make sure you have clean cash on hand when you're making change because women don't want to have oil stained bills to put back in their change purse. So um, make sure your, your money is clean and that your hands are clean when you are dealing with women consumers. All of these are ways to, again, attract women into uh, an environment that, let's face it, is generally culturally slanted toward men. Cars are very much associated with men, clearly. Gas and oil, that seems like a man domain. But here you have gas oil companies saying, no, no, women are welcome here. Women are invited in. And sure, maybe it's to get their, their dollars and cents, but nevertheless, there's a, an acknowledgement that women are important consumers who need to be spoken to and need to be treated in ways that will make them welcome in this domain. Now, I imagine there are some sharp-eyed viewers out there who are looking at this particular pure oil cottage and saying, that looks familiar, um, and particularly um, folks maybe from Hamilton, and you would be right. Uh, up until recently, this former pure oil gas station stood at the intersection of Millville and Main Street in Hamilton. Uh, had, unfortunately, it was torn down recently to accommodate a change in the road. Um, but nevertheless, you can still see the basic outline of that building, the two chimneys, the, the gabled roof, the welcoming brick staircase into the front door with the two side uh, uh, railings. So this is much, very much a neighborhood feel. Now, if you were to walk into one of these stations, well, this is what you would essentially see. So what you have here is the floor plan for that very same um, pure oil style English cottage. Um, so the floor plan here, 13 by 20. And some of the things that are being done here on the interior are addressing women as consumers and drivers, not just in terms of what's on the outside of the building and the accommodating with the clean money, but also what's on the inside of the building. And so things that you'll see here that you might not see as necessarily um, special, but a ladies room. Ladies' rooms weren't in most of the early gas station service stations, separate men's and women's rooms here. Uh, and you can even see in this floor plan, you know, the, the directive to have flower boxes at each end of the building and the show window with the gable on the front side. Again, these are very much um, ways to attract women. And so you see service stations and gas and oil companies in particularly are adding amenities within the buildings themselves to accommodate women as consumers of gas and oil products. And so 
having um, separate toilet facilities might seem standard for us, but this is very new for the, the turn of the 20th century and by the, by the 1920s here. Uh, and I'll point out that one of the directives was to make sure that the ladies room had an exterior entrance. And so if you look at that floor plan, you can see all the way over there on the left hand side, the entrance to the ladies room. And you can also see there is no entrance into the actual office space or the grease room um, for whatever that's worth. And this is an attempt to, you know, kind of shield women, if you will, from the kind of more manly work that goes on within a service station. You know, greasing and lubing a car, you know, uh, changing tires, things of that nature. And so allowing women to come in from the outside of the building and accommodating in, in that way was seen as an important step forward for attracting female consumers into these spaces. Uh, and also things that, you know, maybe we take for granted, like hot water and toilets that have flush, you know, on demand, mirrors, paper towels, toilet paper. These are all things that are added to give a sense that, you know, you're not just coming to a gas station, but you're also coming to a space that should be reflective of what you would experience in your home. And maybe, you know, above grade for some people who didn't have flush toilets in their homes, uh, in the early 20s and maybe even into the 1930s. Gas and oil companies are going to take it a step further, though, because beyond these kind of basic amenities of water and toilets and mirrors and things of that nature, some oil companies are going to add restrooms. Now, in our time, we often equate a bathroom and a restroom as the same thing, but in the 1920s, those are separate and independent in the service station world. A bathroom is, you know, the place where the, you have a toilet and a mirror and running water. Restroom is created as a space specifically for women to come and rest and to be able to stop and to enjoy some luxury of, you know, uh, sofas and some comfortable chairs, a little bit of decor, uh, and actually take a moment. Now, part of the reason for adding restrooms specifically to service stations is, again, speaking to this kind of cultural stereotype that motoring is exhausting for women. And by golly, we need to stop and rest and take a break because you know, operating a big machine is taxing on us and we should encourage women to pull over to the road and, and, and stop in comfort so that they don't become overtaxed. Cultural stereotypes. But nevertheless, these are spaces that are created specifically to keep women comfortable and to, again, speak directly to women as, autom as consumers of automobiles and gas and oil products. Now, one of the things that service stations are also attempting to do beyond just providing the basic necessities is how are we going to make sure that these bathrooms and these restrooms, these facilities are going to be maintained at a standard that is acceptable? Again, I suspect in 2020 that we're not um, necessarily expecting overly clean facilities when we visit a gas station or a restroom. Uh, but at the turn of the 20th century and into the 1920s and beyond, there is an expectation, not just for providing uh, what I say here are the comforts of home, but also making sure that they're clean and safe. And so oil companies are going to take on campaigns, hygienic campaigns as a way to um, speak to the safety and the cleanliness of the restrooms that they're providing and the bathrooms that providing. Because what they really want to do is to help assure women that, look, if you pull over to the side of the road and you use, in this case, a shell station, that it will be home clean. That, you know, again, you're not just stopping to experience the service of having your tank refueled, but that you can also um, expect to visit a space that's going to be as clean as you might get as your home. And again, in some cases, maybe cleaner. And so what you see is a company like Shell um, in the 1930s initiating what it refers to as its home clean campaign. 
and being able to say, look, we have inspectors who actually go out and inspect company restrooms. And this was very much the case. And the, the bathrooms that pass our sniff test, if you will, so to speak, are given the good housekeeping seal of approval. And it was a way that you could, again, assure consumers that the facilities they were going to experience under their company logo were going to be up to their standards. Some oil companies actually sent out nurses to inspect bathrooms, you know, the white glove test, looking to make sure the toilet is kept clean and, you know, the sinks are kept clean and that there's plenty of paper towels and mirrors, et cetera, et cetera. And Shell's not the only one that's doing this at this time, indeed. Texaco probably has one of the more um, advanced, we'll say, hygienic campaigns. Uh, it referred to it as the white patrol. Uh, and again, you know, white in some con context pertaining to the expected cleanliness that, you know, the facilities would be clean and you wouldn't see any dirts or smudges on it. And so the Texaco White Patrol is, you know, one of these really aggressive campaigns. As you can see here, they had inspection cars that went out. And they had, in fact, a fleet of 48 of bathroom inspectors who went around the country and visited Texaco dealers, looked at their bathrooms, went through a checklist of things. And if the bathroom that they inspected, of course, unannounced, they would come in just randomly. If they visited your bathroom and it passed the test and met all the criteria, well, then it was certified as being safe particularly for women and children. And as you can see, you would get a sign to display that your bathroom, if you ran the service station, was a registered restroom. Uh, and it was a, a, you know, a sign that you would put out in front of your uh, service station near the road. And you know, travelers going down the highway would say, bah, finally, place I can expect to get a clean bathroom. And it's very effective and it provides a sense of assurance for white travelers who go down the road. And the white patrol, as I say, is in part about cleanliness of a facility, you know, passing that white glove test, but there's also a racial component here as well, because in the time period that we're talking about, 1920s, 1930s, 40s, and in many cases beyond, bathrooms in public spaces and service stations are intended for white customers. And so if you are traveling and you are African-American, these are not places that you are invited to stop. You are not permitted to uh, visit the registered restroom. And so what if you were African-American and you were on the road and as a woman driver, you needed to stop? Well, number one, you had to be careful. And number two, you had to realize that, you know, buying cars meant that you took on an added responsibility and an added, you know, um, concern as a black traveler that didn't necessarily come with being a white traveler and a white consumer of autos. And so many African-Americans, particularly among the middle class, are buying cars because they want to steer clear of that segregated public transportation, which was the norm, particularly in the South. Uh, we're all familiar, I suspect, with you know, the story of segregated buses and African-Americans forced to sit in the back. Uh, white travelers in the front. And so the car is a way for African Americans who can uh, have access to a vehicle is a way to kind of steer clear and get away from that segregated public transportation. But it also doesn't necessarily do away with the, you know, again, the Jim Crow laws and other codes that are in place to prevent African Americans from utilizing the same public spaces and public restrooms and public water fountains, et cetera, waiting rooms and the like as white travelers. And this extends to service station facilities. 
And so what you see is that a lot of African-American travelers will try to accommodate their own you know, uh, needs by carrying a bucket in the back of a car, or they did manufacture like small portable toilets that fit in the car as a way for uh, black travelers to take care of their needs. In 1936, the Green Book will be introduced. And again, I imagine many out there are more familiar with the Green Book, a movie of the same name was recently popular. But as you can see, the Green Book doesn't come out until 1936. Prior to that, you had to really um, kind of know where you could stop. The Green Book is going to provide more direction, more detail on where Black travelers can stop to visit friendly businesses, places where they would not be uh, looked down upon by using the station. And indeed, in the Green Book, you see service stations that are uh, reflective of either Black service station owners or places that don't mind that African Americans use the same facilities as other clients. And so really what the Green Book is allowing African-American travelers is a greater sense of freedom, being able to move, you know, less molested ways than they would without um, benefit of the Green Book. And so by the end of the 1930s and then into the 1940s, you see women taking on different roles within the service station industry. And this obviously corresponds with the onset of World War II, when women are going to be asked to move into the workplace in a number of different industries. The same will be true of the service station industry. And so you see women, as you do here, um, pumping gas and working on cars. There are women mechanics in this time period who are doing uh, work on engines in the absence of men who have been called off to war. Uh, here in Ohio, one of the more popular uh, groups of women who work in the service station industry are known as Sohioettes. Uh, they work for the um, Sohio or you know, uh, oil company, which is now uh, becoming defunct. Uh, uh, but they you know, catered to the needs of motorists and worked as part of the war effort. And really what you see happening then in the 1940s and the onset of World War II and the ending of World War II is also in many ways the apex and apex, I should say, and decline of women as being influential in gas and oil industry. In other words, women as consumers, once the war ends, well, that becomes less important. Uh, and this is in part a cultural maneuver. Uh, women, as we know, in the 1950s are pushed back into those domestic spaces largely. Many women do stay and work in public sphere, but many more are expected to go back into the home, raise families, take care of children. And so they're less visible, uh, although they're not less visible in, in their cars. And so this is kind of a catch-22 in some ways. Service stations as a reflection both of you know, kind of movement of women back into the home, but also the kind of common sight of women in cars and driving cars. Well, they think they don't have to work as hard to capture the woman consumer, the female consumer. And so in some ways you see service stations, in other words, places where you would find comforts like restrooms and money and the efforts to help uh, attract women, those are becoming less important. And service stations are working not as hard to attract women consumers. And so they take a turn into becoming more gas stations. The place you go to get gas, maybe pick up a box of chiclets and a soda, and you get back in the car and you get on the road. But the double-edged sword of that is, again, while well, women were no longer necessarily a special market for gas and oil that had to be catered to, part of the reason for that is that women had become a fixture of automobiling, of motoring. They were expected to be in cars and to be consumers. And so 
it's the, you know, the double-edged sword, the, the, the kind of the niceties that go with trying to attract women consumers start to fade as women become obvious consumers of cars and gasoline and oil products. So I want to thank you for joining me, and I hope uh, this was informative and entertaining. Thank you.